<coughs> All right. So we go on to a summary of uh, these are your contract law notes, okay, unit two notes which we are looking at. So just to summarize, what we have looked at is, if you look at the just the uh, you know to to wrap up the particular modules within the contract law, uh, the larger module. What are the sub modules that we have covered? Okay, we have covered. Uh, we started with the interpretation clause. Remember, we started with the interpretation clause with section two. Okay, so you have two ways you can do the interpretation clause. You can either follow the uh, sequence given in the Bear Act, or you can do what I have uh, told you to do, which is uh, the way that you do it, like starting with what is a contract and then going on to uh, sort of slowly disaggregating the contract. That is, a contract is an agreement enforceable by law. And then, of course, then you have to define what an agreement is, okay? Um, and then an agreement is essentially uh, every promise and every set of promises forming the consideration for each other, okay? So then you break down what is a promise. Promise is a proposal which is accepted. Okay, so this is your first module, which is the interpretation clause, which includes basically the, uh, essentially the disaggregation of the idea of the contract okay going up uh, you know backwards also almost starting from the contract and going all the way back to the uh, to the proposal okay and then we have an of course consideration also and so the other aspect of the first module which is the interpretation section 2 essentially the first sub module within contracts is uh, the all the distinctions that we did between voidable contract okay uh, void agreement all those things remember all those distinctions are actually given to you by the language of the contract uh, of the statute itself Okay, I have just used particular uh, Clauses from section 2 okay, which we essentially tell you uh, tell you all the differences Okay, and as far as uh, just to recap on uh, on uh, this point uh, Some of the concern some of the expressions that I had used like voidable agreement where I had said that uh, instead of using the word voidable contract they should use the word voidable agreement uh, I think let's let's leave this aside for now. Okay, I don't want to confuse you guys to you know at this early stage. So I put it in very small font. You can just effectively ignore it. Okay, so just let's just learn. Uh, let's not critique the act at this stage. Let's just learn it as it is normally taught. Okay, and as everybody else agree uh, understands it. Okay, because these ideas have not been uh, discussed publicly. So anyway, so these are the other distinctions that you've learned. That is all the differences between really contract, void agreement, voidable contract, and a contract which becomes void. Okay, all these distinctions that you learned. So that also forms part of your uh, module uh, to your se uh, section two interpretation clause, the first sub module. Okay, so as you're learning, you should also remember that you should also be preparing for your interviews mentally in the sense that when you go to your interviews, you'll be asked two types of questions. One is the kind of question that will be just uh, you know out of the blue which you can't anticipate so they might ask you something and, and you may or may not know the answer to that and then the other type of questions which you can reasonably expect is that they especially if you haven't been able to answer the first question they might ask you like tell us what okay then tell me what you've learned okay <clears throat> so in that case you should be ready with uh, whatever your subject is okay whatever your subject you end up choosing uh, but anything that you've learned even in your first year, okay, so you can talk about lab or whatever if you want to talk about and you start thinking about divide, dividing the subject up into little modules and uh, so you can talk about we learned about what is a contract, how to disaggregate a contract, we, we saw the interpretation clause and we saw all these differences between a contract and a void agreement and this and that. So you should start thinking about modules so that when they ask you what have you learned, okay, you should go back with some, you should, uh, you know, sort of reply to that with a very specific set of answers, which is a very tightly defined topic. Don't give them like wide topics like some of your seniors and super seniors sometimes have said, you know, we learned about stock markets. Now stock markets is a very wide, it's like a wide goalpost. Then they might just shoot some question through that goalpost, which is some topic in stock markets which has not been covered. Is quite possible because it's a very broad topic so you should look to always give them very tightly defined topics which you have covered and mastered quite well okay so if you talk about these kinds of districts so if you talk about all these distinctions all the distinctions between the four types of concepts we discussed so that's a very tightly defined topic and there you can answer it with confidence and they can't ask you kind of you know uh, broad que I mean questions so that should be your task. So as you are studying, you should also understand these kind of uh, sub modules within the larger modules and all the concepts that you are learning, and how these can form, uh, you know, the material for what you do in your how you answer in your interviews. Are you able to follow what we are saying? Yes. Okay. So you master as you study, you master these concepts. Okay. Say you can say that. Okay, I'm going to master this 
all these distinctions okay and uh, maybe you can also talk to them about how you learned about the second part which we are coming to which is when we go to uh, another thing you can also talk about is if you talk, talk about uh, section the chapter 2 of the contract act okay where you have all these sections from all the way from 10 to 30 okay so in chapter 2 what did we do we just started with section 10 and we saw that in section 10 there are like five so section 10 is a very important section because what does it do what is the title of section 10 what agreements are contracts okay so it answers this very important question of okay so you've told us that a contract is a, an agreement enforceable by law okay but then how do i know when i'm looking at an agreement okay so there's another module another sub module that you can prepare for and answer in your interview okay and discuss in your interview is that this whole business of agreement and contract when i'm looking at an agreement how would i know whether this agreement is actually a void agreement or is it a contract okay so how do i uh, come to this conclusion well the, the answer lies in section 10 and section 10 gives us these five filters okay and as we go through these and all these five filters have to be cleared okay so and as we go through the five filters we can see that actually section 10 eventually leads us to all the other sections of chapter 2 okay all the sections from 10, 11 to 20 okay uh, 11 to 30 are all covered essentially from uh, starting from section 10 itself it will eventually lead you stepwise to all those sections are you following what we discussed remember so that if you start with the fifth one which is expressly not expressly here, hereby declared to be void that will take you to sections 25 to 30 okay so i've eliminated section 20 from that list and then lawful consideration and lawful object will read you to i think uh, 23 and 24 okay then competency to contract okay who is competent to contract will lead you to section 11 and 12 okay and then when, once you go into the law the first one which is free consent free consent will lead you all the way from 13 okay so 13 will lead you then then you will have uh, consent is defined in 13 then you have free consent okay and then free consent in, in turn section 14 will lead you to all the other sections 15 16 17 18 19 21 22 so in this way you can see the structure starting from center section 10 in the middle which leads you to all of section of uh, you know chapter 2 okay of the contract so this can also be a topic for discussion that how essentially we and because this is a very important question whenever you're looking at an agreement okay you have to decide whether this the first decision is whether this is a void agreement or is it actually enforceable and is it a contract therefore okay so this can be answered by looking at the guidance given by section 10 and this covers the whole of chapter 2 so this is another aspect we have covered under contract law okay and then we have covered some stray ideas which are important also which are like that ac acceptance has to be absolute that uh, counter offer is not acceptance okay then we have covered things like uh, uh, promises very important in section 9 okay that promises can be expressed and implied okay actually there should be promises ex they've discussed promises expressed and implied so essentially when we say promises can be we should say promises can be expressed or implied okay so express promise is what what is an express promise one which is made in words okay so words means could be written or oral okay and then uh, of course if it's not if it is what is an implied promise through action through actions but what the con what the statute says yeah conduct of parties yes that is how you interpret it but uh, what does the statute say otherwise than in words otherwise than in words okay so words and otherwise than in words that's mentioned in section 9 that's important because many uh, students have uh, uh, a misconception that a contract has to be written and registered and all that okay it doesn't have to be it doesn't even have to be oral okay there need not even have been any discussion it can be just inferred from the contract conduct of parties okay so should they require a person who can uh, be a proof for the eyewitness like if i'm promising someone and the other day i just uh, walk back from my word but there should be a third person who can say yes you uh, said this order to promise uh, someone right? yeah see here you're raising a point i understand what you're raising that you're thinking about how do you prove it okay so that should be treated as a separate issue okay so when you're thinking about what the law requires in terms of um, the, you know the, the attributes okay the law does not require a contract even to be written okay or, or it doesn't even require to be it to be oral okay the law is ready to even infer the existence of a contract from the conduct of parties the question that you're raising is a slightly different is a different question which is a question of how are you going to prove it in court 
okay so when you are thinking about the first question which is what does the law actually require then you can assume that that second question has been satisfactorily answered so you assume that you can prove it in court okay so in fact what might happen of course is that in a, in a, in a real life situation you may actually have a contract but you may not be able to establish the existence of the contract in court because there you have to adduce evidence and the evidence has to be uh, believable by the court so the court has to consider it credible okay so that is a separate problem okay so that should not affect your understanding of what the law requires in terms of the existence of a contract this is clear it has to be treated as separate because many times it happens even in the criminal law for instance where uh, you know that somebody has come in like if you are a public prosecutor you are prosecuting someone okay you don't bring just every charge that you think that the criminal the accused is guilty of you only bring those charges which you can prove which is there in your notes but we didn't cover it it's not in your syllabus that in a criminal case you have to prove every charge beyond a reasonable doubt because the standard of proof is the highest in a criminal trial okay so a prosecutor will only bring those charges which he is fairly confident that he can prove beyond a reasonable doubt now he may believe that the criminal has actually committed a lot of other crimes but he may feel that we don't have the evidence to uh, you know uh, sort of uh, convict him okay with uh, you know beyond by presenting evidence beyond a reasonable proof and establish the fact that he has committed those crimes so they let those go they only charge him with those crimes that they are confident that they can prove okay so that's a separate this uh, question okay all right okay so we covered these other stray ideas as well and then uh, we also looked at uh, so these are the three um, sort of two sub modules so far okay and if you take this uh, the the points we covered uh, as stray ideas that is section 7 and section 9 okay you can look at them as the third module and that actually leads us as part of the third module you can look at this uh, chapter 1 okay which is dealing with the communication acceptance and revocation of proposals okay so do you guys understand what revocation is taking, taking back correct taking back so re revocation has the sense of taking back okay so i revoke the offer okay so somebody might so when you are going for placement a company might make you an offer during placement and then the company might actually give you maybe 10 days okay and after 10 days if you have not accepted the offer they might revoke the offer or even within 10 days they can actually technically revoke the offer okay so uh, so the revo revocation has the sense of taking back something which was given earlier okay so especially it's used in the in the in the context of offers and uh, and things like that so so therefore because what is happening why is chapter 1 dealing with the communication acceptance and revocation of proposals why is that important because remember that what is a we what is an agreement set of promises okay or you can say reciprocal promises which form the consideration for each other that's an agreement okay and what is a promise yeah not the acceptance of a proposal a proposal which has been accepted okay a promise is a proposal which has been accepted okay so that's why chapter one is titled communication acceptance and revocation of proposal because uh, proposals because the moment a proposal is accepted it becomes a promise okay and if there's a reciprocal promise it will be an agreement and then it only remains to pass through the filters of section 10 okay so that's why section it's very important to be clear as to when exactly what are the standards for acceptance what are the standards for communication okay so if i'm making an offer to somebody okay i can just i mean maybe that person is uh, like in a different city and i just sit in my room and say okay i'm making an offer to ajay of this that's not sufficient because he has to hear the offer okay the offer has to come to his knowledge okay so uh, so that's these are the kinds of things that are so we are setting certain standards for the communication of proposals okay and acceptance of proposals also there are certain standards so in chapter one we will look at we're not covering chapter one section by section okay but we will have some reference to chapter one we have already covered some parts like that is section seven which is acceptance must be absolute and section nine which is that promises can be expressed or implied okay so these two important sections we have covered and we'll make some reference to you guys should also read for some of your cases if you feel that some of these sections are relevant you can go and refer to them like some of you did that kind of homework for this case you tried to refer to some of the sections okay so this these are some this is this is basically like the set of some modules within contract law that we have covered so say so your interpretation clause then uh, chapter 2 which is uh, starting from section 10 and covering all the sections from 11 to 30 
and then you can say your third sub module is chapter one essentially parts of chapter one and uh, looking at particular uh, ideas within chapter one okay so these are your uh, this is your wrap up on contract law but briefly let me just come through to this uh, okay here's where you have a little bit of a problem okay because i'm looking at this thing but you can see it later on on your own okay uh, in the um, maybe i can actually draw it on the board also here so you have contracts which are um, What is happening? How do you open this? I've never. Right. Okay, just pull it out. Okay, so here we have uh, agreements which are split into uh, contracts and void no void agreements. Okay, B A here. Okay, so under contracts we will have two types of contracts. Okay, which is voidable contracts and yeah, and here this non-voidable you have to be careful uh, that. This is not a term that exists uh, in the statute and people don't normally use this term. The only reason I've used the term is because I wanted to make a distinction between this and here you can go back to your uh, first principle of taxonomy that whenever you're doing any kind of taxonomy, you should have the categories, these taxa, these are taxa, each of these, this is a taxon, that is T-A-X-O-N, okay, this category is a taxon and these plural is taxa. So the taxa have to be mutually exclusive at any level when you are doing a taxonomy. Okay? The reason the taxonomy is very important is when you are, one of the things that people expect, one of the things that you will face in the world of business is you will face very unstructured situations. Okay? In the world of business, your problems will not come to you purely in a silo kind of structure where okay, this is only a marketing problem. Okay? Every problem has you know aspects of all different disciplines like uh, different uh, domains like finance, marketing, operations, legal, everything will be mixed up in a particular problem you face in the real world, okay? So there's a very unstructured kind of situation. So if you have a, a knack for taxonomy, it will help you to bring order to the situation, okay? That is why taxonomy is important, to have some idea about uh, how to do good taxonomy, okay? So if you have this classification and then under voidable, of course you have, either it's, if it's voidable, then it is, so it is rendered void okay what is meant by rendered void rendered void means that the that let's go back to the example of that girl who was uh, married off to the old man okay through deception so she may actually then uh, exercise her right to you know not perform that contract and then she may go to the court and tell the court and if she can establish before the court that this uh, there was deception okay practiced on her uh, and that's how she was induced to marry this man so the court will annul the marriage so one of the things that can happen in a voidable contract is that it can actually be rendered void okay so the other thing that can happen is that it can be performed okay so the other option that she has is she can perform the contract that as we said voidable contract does not mean that she has to necessarily uh, have the contract rendered void she can also decide to perform the contract and remain married okay so I'll perform the, the contractual obligations of the marriage. So once once the contract is performed, we say that the contract is discharged. D is for discharge. You can see this later on on your, on your framework. Okay. So this is one kind of uh, set of uh, outcomes that can uh, transpire. Okay. Let's look at the other one here. Okay. Which is then if you have a non-voidable contract, then the question that will... Uh, contract which becomes void okay does contract become void so again that machine making a noise okay i don't know why it keeps acting up on its own it's like a, okay so uh, so yeah okay so um, this can either be yes or it can be no okay so remember in a non voidable contract one of the things can happen is one of the things that can happen is now this contract is perfectly fine at the beginning it is enforceable against both parties okay but then some event can uh, transpire in which basically the contract becomes void okay so you have a situation where a contract which becomes void so the question we're asking is does it become void in that way uh, if it's yes then it will go back into the category of a void agreement okay or if can actually the answer can be no which means it remains as a normal contract okay it does not become void in this case it's no in this case again your subdivision is that it is either performed okay or it is breached so there will we'll do some cases of breach of contract 
Okay, so either so it, it remains a normal contract. So either you perform the contract, perform means you every party, both parties will discharge their obligations under the contract. Okay, so once it is performed, we say that the contract has been discharged. Okay, and here if there is a breach of contract, okay, here there is a breach of contract. Okay, if you have a breach of contract, you can actually sue for. Um, as you can see again, you can sue for what is called specific performance and then you can sue for damages, okay? Alright, so let me just briefly explain. Are you following so far? Is everyone following so far? Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, so contract did not become void, uh, it remained here, so you have two things can happen. Parties can perform the contract smoothly and then we say the contract is discharged, okay? So, and then all one party can breach the contract, okay? So that is one party refuses to perform uh, its obligations under the contract. In that case, the other party can do two things. It can either sue for damages, for breach of contract, okay, whatever loss or injury you suffered to reclaim that. And the other option is that it can sue for what is called specific performance. In this case, what we are saying is we are not interested in any damages, but we want the other party to force, or you force the other party to perform the contract, okay? So one example of this is, that under the Hindu Marriage Act, we have something called, uh, I think it's section 11, which is there's something called restitution of conjugal rights, under which say for instance, if a wife, let's say has uh, uh, gone back to her, you know, parents house, okay? And then the husband can actually sue uh, the wife, okay? And ask the court to order the wife to come back and live with him, okay? Because they still remain husband and wife. So here, what he's gonna argue essentially is that this, this, um, you know, the the contract of marriage. Okay, she is still bound by the contract of marriage, and that requires her to live with me. Okay, uh, and, and so the court should order her to come back and live with me. And this is basically this is this this section is start titled the restitution of conjugal rights. Okay, are you following? So here the wife will be forced to come back and live with the husband and perform her, uh, you know, marital. Obligations. Okay, so this uh, this is a little bit of uh, a uh, little bit of uh, controversy around this section. Uh, there was one uh, ruling in which a judge had actually one of the High Court judges, I think, in the Madras High Court, had actually uh, said that this kind of thing is barbaric. You can't have this uh, kind of a, uh, a woman being forced, okay, to for come back. But essentially, it was it was uh, upheld by the Supreme Court. Okay, that because the court wants to, uh, you know honor uh, the uh, you want it wants to respect the the marital bond okay so uh, there's some controversy about this so anyway so this is the, this is the breakup so this is the kind of a taxonomy of uh, agreements okay so uh, this is this covers your contract law or contract law theoretical parts and then we go into the uh, discussion of cases okay so all right any questions that guys at this stage on contracts yeah in breach of contract, it will be after uh, suing for. Uh, Why don't we use the mic? Let's let's have the mic. Mm -hmm. Does she have the mic? Sir, so, uh, in the breach of contract, either the aggrieved party would sue for the specific performance or the damages. Yeah. Both cannot. Uh, it cannot sue for both the things. You can't sue for both because if you are getting specific performance, then you are not entitled to damages anymore. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. So no questions, no further questions. So we still have about half an hour, which is what we had in the other class. Yes, you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in case of a breach, is it uh, necessary to be on specific performance or damages? Uh, there might be a reason that the non voidable contract, which uh, in, uh, which in one uh, one party has agreed to be uh, considered it to be a void. Void contract and the other is still uh, considering. You, you just use the word void contract. No, never use the word void contract. Uh, so come again. I'm not able to follow what you're suggesting. Sir, uh, it's a non-voidable contract to begin with. Okay, but and it has some clause uh, from uh, where we can say a contract is void. Again, you're saying contract is void. So what are you trying to get at? You're saying there's an exit clause. Yeah. Are you saying there's an exit clause? So for example, if an insurance company, I have insured my shop and due to some natural calamity, my shop collapsed. I, if I go for a claim, they say, okay, it's because of a natural calamity, so we are not going to uh, pay for that. Uh, okay. 
So in this case, I can't do anything. I am uh, able to do anything as it's written there. Okay. Natural but, calamities are not covered. Yeah, natural calamities are not covered. Okay. But there, there might be some situations where one person. You are also not using the mic properly. One oh, party out yeah. of the two is uh, saying no, uh, it's a non voidable uh, contract, and the other is saying no, it has uh, transferred, it has become a voidable agreement. So, no, no, no. Actually, you see, first of all, one thing you have to be clear about if the contract explicitly says that natural calamities, damage due to natural calamities, has is not covered, then it is not even a question of breach. Breach is only uh, the word breach is only going to be used when then explicit written of I mean ex explicit obligation need not be written. Okay, when a clearly uh, determined I mean when there is a determination that this obligation exists and the party has failed to perform that obligation, only then can you say there is a breach. If it is clearly stated in the insurance contract that natural calamities are not covered and then the insurance company is not paying for damages for natural calamity, then where is the question of breach? There is no breach. Sir, there is no question. They never promised to cover that anyway. There is no question of breach. Yeah. But uh, in some other situation, like two uh, two people come into a partnership, and due to some reason, uh, one uh, partner says, "Okay, because of this reason, it has gone into a voidable agreement." But the other uh, states that this is not the right reason to uh, convert into. No, in that case, that will have to go to court. That dispute will have to go to court, and the court will have to assess whether which i mean which party is correct whether there is an obligation to perform the contract or whether there is an actual uh, opportunity to exit okay that will have to be decided by the court okay is this clear okay anybody else okay all right so then let's see again we keep on losing the connection i don't know why this is happening okay luckily we have i think almost everything opened um I'm actually afraid to change this chart because uh, okay so now what we are going to discuss guys is okay I'm gonna have a problem because if there is if the link is not if the internet is not working I need to open okay there was a news item now what we are going to do now is we have about 25 minutes in the other class we had 35 minutes so um, okay so we're going to discuss uh, I mean business and finance in general okay we're not going to waste this time so what we are going to do is i've lost the connection there is a very big problem with the internet connection now and i don't even have this okay so although it shows on paper that we have the um, so okay it's not going to work so i'm going to just have to talk about it okay let's okay so the first thing i'm going to cover now is um, the you know in the second question that i've given you the second question is on um, the pharmaceutical society of great britain right Okay, so versus Boots Cash Chemist Southern Limited. Okay, so that's a pretty well known case. I think we've got this back. Let me open this uh, right now. And uh, let me also change the chart. I'm going to just briefly cover the. Um, Sir, yes. Yeah, yeah. So again, Vaishali will keep track. Doorkeeper. Who, only one person has to go out at a time. Okay. All right. Uh, let's just look at the daily chart and in, in dollar yen. Okay. In uh, Singh versus Ruby. Okay. Like now, uh, in the other class, uh, Kanoria asked a question about. Uh, ex I mean, she asked us to explain. She asked me to explain the uh, the questions in the pharmaceutical society case because I've asked about uh, two questions. What is the issue prima facie? and what is the underlying issue okay or the issue as a general principle so let me explain that's a good question actually so let me explain once again what that means with respect to a particular example okay so uh, so the first point is the, so the first point is what is the issue prima facie is very simple let's take an example okay uh, we take an example where uh, we take an income tax case okay where uh, the assessee has declared his income as 50 lakhs okay and let's say that the assessing officer is saying no your income is not 50 lakhs your income is yeah so your income is uh, 50 uh, is 65 lakhs okay so there is a difference of 15 lakhs and the assessing officer is saying that uh, this 15 lakhs additional amount also should be included in your income okay so the issue prima facie now when this case goes to you know income tax cases in india go through several levels okay you start with the assessing officer then it goes to the commissioner income tax appeals so cit appeals then it goes to the income tax appellate tribunal then it goes to the high court and then it goes to the supreme court okay so it's a long route 
and uh, so what happens is I mean it goes on first appeal so the way that the authority will frame the uh, the issue prima facie in the case you'll see this when you read the judgments the issue prima facie will be quite apparent because most of the time the judge himself will write it out okay the issue in this case is whether this that so in this particular case what will happen is the issue prima facie will be written as whether the assessee's income for assessment year so and so okay is 50 lakhs or 65 lakhs okay this is going to be the issue prima facie because the issue is actually nothing but what is the point that these guys are fighting over okay so this is what they are fighting over because the assessing officer is saying no your income should be 65 lakhs and this guy is saying the assessee is saying no my income should be 50 lakhs okay so the court will just write out the issue prima facie in this manner saying whether the assessee's income so issue is always written like this whether this is true or whether this is true whether this person has committed the offense of theft theft okay so whether the assessee's income should be 50 lakhs or 65 lakhs okay now now if you delve deeper into the facts of this case let's assume the facts of this case are such that so this particular 15 lakhs discrepancy is coming from obviously the assessing officer also has some logic okay he's looking at some transaction so let's say this particular assessee has actually invested uh, let's say three crores of rupees he has invested in you can't actually under the current law you can't invest that much money abroad in one year but let's say that he is for the sake of argument he has invested three crore rupees outside in singapore in singapore he's put it on a singapore dollar deposit okay so he transferred out rupees and he uh, you know uh, 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 has put it on a deposit in the singapore bank in singapore dollars okay you understand this concept that every currency is a different account unit of account okay so you can't like add amounts in singapore dollars and uh, amounts in rupees you can't just add them together it's like adding inches and feet okay you have to convert it to the same unit okay so every currency if you want to add currency amount you have to convert it to the same currency you can standardize it okay so he has transferred this and let's say that the singapore dollar has appreciated against the rupee like right now the level is around 51.7 okay so let's say this has appreciated and he started when it was like 41 okay so when he invested the money uh, when he converted his indian rupees into singapore so the way the transaction works is you learn a little bit about financial market transactions as well that every transaction in a financial market should be seen as an exchange of assets okay pretty much every transaction even in a, in a physical goods uh, sale uh, it, you can think of every transaction as an exchange of assets okay barring uh, barring transactions in services okay where you are exchanging services but any transaction in financial assets or goods it's useful to think of this framework that every transaction is an exchange of assets okay so when you go to the market and buy sugar you are what are you are exchanging assets in the sense that sugar is coming to you so we treat sugar as an asset everything is treated as an asset so goods are also a type of asset and currencies are also a type of asset okay everything is a type of the stock is an asset a bond is an asset everything is an asset okay so every transaction is a tra exchange of assets so when you buy sugar the exchange that is happening is two assets are being exchanged sugar is being given to you and you are parting with what asset cash, cash. cash. so in this particular case we would say we would be specific and say if the transaction is happening in delhi we say it's you are parting with indian rupees okay so if you are buying in tokyo if you're buying sugar in tokyo most likely what is happening is you are getting sugar and you're parting with japanese yen okay so this is how we would describe it so japanese yen would be treated as a different asset as you know as compared when compared to the rupee okay each country each currency is a different asset so in this case what happens is they do a first exchange of assets where they convert the indian rupees and buy singapore dollars and put it on deposit in the singapore account okay now that happens when the exchange rate is 41 which means what one indian rupees you go to 41 singapore dollars yeah so one singapore dollar is equal to 41 rupees okay that is how it is uh, quoted and so you have to be clear about that also when the exchange rate what does it actually mean okay so like i was just showing you dollar yen earlier dollar yen we would have seen the rate is around somewhere around 112 or something like that so that again means 112 yen per for one us dollar Okay, you have to be clear about that as well okay so now this guy has seen this appreciation in the singapore dollar after he converted and put it on deposit in the singapore dollar let's say in the space of one year itself it went from 41 to 51 okay and this actually has led to a uh, if you calculate the rupee amount of the profit okay the the profit that he has uh, received on the, uh, you know re, uh, it's an unrealized profit so okay the mic, so the, mic the mic has gone off i know but maybe the battery has run out we have this problem from time to time yeah the battery is gone i don't know why the battery keeps dying out so quickly 
Okay, never mind. I can use this mic, yeah. Okay, so, um, all right. Even this is not seen. Okay, so uh, this is appreciated from 41 to 51. Okay, so here what we say is that, but he has not closed his deposit. He's not liquidated his deposit in Singapore. Okay, it remains on deposit in Singapore. So he's still holding it abroad as, a, for, uh, as an asset overseas. And what he's saying is, so, uh, and let's say that on that, the amount of appreciation that you have seen on this is basically uh, amounting to 15 lakhs. Okay. And this is where the controversy arises because the assessing officer is saying, okay, this is one more point to understand that when you are trading in, if you are, if say Singapore dollar exchange rate, Singapore dollar rupee exchange rate is written as say 41 means that one, uh, one Singapore dollar equals 41 rupees. If this is how it's written. Okay then whenever you're making any profit or loss in this particular market okay and every exchange of assets when it's happening when there are two unique assets we treat that as a market okay so we treat the singapore dollar rupee as a market okay so in the singapore dollar rupee market every time because the rate of the way the exchange rate is quoted is that one uh, singapore dollar is equal uh, equals so many rupees and the amount of rupees that is uh, equal to one Singapore dollar that keeps fluctuating that's where the rate is keeps fluctuating so in this kind of a market when you make any profits or losses those profits or losses are going to be in what Singapore dollars or rupees is my question clear yes. question is not clear Singapore dollar rupee is treated as a market any kind of pair of assets will be will create a different market okay yen against US dollars is one market sterling against US dollars uh, sterling against US dollars is a different market because any of the assets changes then the market changes okay so now what we are saying is you have to be clear as to which in every market what is the quoting convention so in the dollar yen market you know the quoting convention is that's so many yen per dollar that keeps fluctuating sometimes it is 95 sometimes it is 105 so what is fluctuating is the number of yen per dollar that one dollar is not changing okay so here also in the Singapore dollar in the Singapore dollar rupee market the one Singapore dollar business is not changing what is fluctuating when it goes from 41 to 51 is how many rupees are required to buy one Singapore dollar okay this is clear this is the scheme now in this kind of situation so in the Singapore dollar rupee market if you make a profit or a loss is that profit or loss to be counted in rupees or Singapore dollars okay so we have a difference of opinion here some are saying Singapore dollars and some are saying rupees okay let's uh, let's come up with a simple log simple rule which you should never forget uh, where you can always solve this problem okay now when you go let's say you're a sugar trader in India okay so you first buy 10 quintals of sugar at uh, say 50 rupees per quintal okay and then you sell those uh, 10 quintals at 75 rupees per quintal okay so you have made 25 rupees per quintal profit okay now this profit is in sugar or in uh, rupees? rupees profit is in rupees okay now if you look at the sugar market in indian rupees how is it quoted is it uh, number of rupees per quintal of sugar or the number of quintals of sugar per indian rupee number of rupees per quintal of sugar okay so if number of rupees per quintal of sugar in this kind of a market when the market is quoting like this okay then you say that the profit and loss is made in Indian rupees okay so the same logic should apply here also if the Singapore dollar rupee market is quoted in this way that it means I mean the quote means that one rupee uh, sorry uh, variable rupees it takes to buy one Singapore dollar that keeps fluctuating are you following yes. some people have uh, totally dozed off okay so uh, are you following what happened what is the problem okay all right so uh, so so come back to that example so in the sugar market if sh if the sugar market is quoting as number of rupees per unit of sugar quintal is one unit you can also quote it in kilos or whatever so if the sugar market is quoting as indian rupees per unit of sugar okay and then you say that in the sugar market the when any profit or loss is made in the indian sugar market it is made in rupees okay now come back to the parallel example of the singapore dollar rupee market in the Singapore dollar rupee market, we are saying it is quoted as number of rupees per unit of Sing dollars. Okay, here the unit is one. Okay, it could have been hundred also if you wanted to, but the convention is that it is one. Are you following my logic? Yes, sir. Okay. So if you use the parallel logic, then in the Singapore dollar rupee market, any profits and losses you make are going to be in what? Rupees. rupees. So now the Singapore dollar camp has changed the view. Okay. So now you understand. So if you ever forget 
you can work it backwards like this that when you're buying and selling sugar in India you make any profits that's always going to be in rupees okay so you work it backwards from there if you get confused in any other market okay so now what we are saying is this three crore rupees that you converted into Singapore dollars and put on deposit in the Singapore uh, in a Singapore bank is now showing an unrealized profit of 15 lakhs okay we are calling it an unrealized profit because he has not reconverted that Singapore dollar uh, he has not liquidated the Singapore dollar deposit not sold the Singapore dollars and bought it back and bought back Indian rupees once he does that we will call it a realized profit as of now it remains an unrealized profit is everyone clear about this what is an unrealized profit okay and what is a realized profit so an unrealized profit is also referred to as a mark to market profit mark to market mark as in you know marks you get marks for your exams mark to market okay mark to market only means that you just whatever assets or liabilities you have you revalue them okay you, you're familiar with the balance sheet okay you revalue them using the current market rates okay so if you have some inventory you know you've done accounting you've done inventory revaluation yes. okay you can have impairment charges and all those kinds of things so mark to market only means that you are marking everything you are just revaluing all your assets and liabilities by using current market rates not historical rates okay so is this clear are you guys following so far okay I mean look like you're falling you're not falling asleep okay all right okay so um, so is this clear now so that why is the dispute arising the AO is not a madman okay there is some logic in what he's saying he's his, his view is that even if you have an unrealized profit on investments in foreign countries okay so this is an investment in a foreign country if you have an unrealized profit on an investment in a foreign country that unrealized profit should be treated as part of your income for that financial year whatever amount of profit you made in this year okay so they'll take the rate at the beginning of the year and the rate at the end of the year the foreign exchange rate okay and they will see how much they'll see that okay at the beginning of the year the uh, Singapore dollars were worth uh, 41 rupees per dollar and at the end of the year they are worth now 51 rupees per dollar okay and let's say this this amount amounts to a gain of 50, 15 lakhs okay so this is where the AO's difference of 15 lakhs is coming from are you following now yes. this example that we have discussed okay so now what will happen is so that's why if we go back to the case now the statement of the issue in the case right so we stated it uh, as the issue prima facie okay which is basically going to be always going to be tied up with the particular facts of that case okay so here as we said we've already discussed that the issue prima facie in this case is going to be stated as whether the assessee's income for assessment year so and so is 50 lakhs or is it 50 uh, 65 lakhs is this clear so now you can see that obviously you can't take this statement of the issue to some other case because there the numbers are not going to be 50 lakhs and 65 lakhs there'll be some different set of numbers okay some other SSE some other case will be different so the statement of the issue prima facie is always tied uh, tied up intimately with the facts of that particular case okay it will be stated in this manner is this clear now what is now now that you understand where the dispute dispute is arising from okay because the assessee is saying that no unrealized profits should not be treated as part of my income because I have not yet realized this profit I have not liquidated that Singapore dollar deposit I have not uh, you know converted the Singapore dollars back into Indian rupees if I did that then it would be a realized profit then I would be treated as part of my income okay so the SSE is saying unrealized profit should not be treated as part of my income but the assessing officer is saying no even if it's unrealized okay it should be treated as part of your income okay so now we can state the issue more generally okay we can state it in a very because when we are stating the issue in a very general way the objective is to basically now start looking at what the ratio is how the ratio is going to come out this is going to be intimately connected to the ratio density of the case so we want to state it in as general a way as possible so here we will say <coughs> so whether investment so the issue in, at a general level okay so the, the underlying issue will be <coughs> <coughs> sorry that whether investments in foreign countries you can actually make it even more general and say including even domestic situations okay if you want to make it really general and in this case let's just talk about the foreign countries whether investments in assets in foreign countries okay and when i say assets means it in this case it happens to be a bank deposit it could have been a house you bought in australia when you bought the house it was worth you know maybe uh, three crores now at the end of the financial year because of house price appreciation in australia this house is now worth 4 crore rupees if you converted it at using market rates 
if you convert notionally convert it it's now worth four crores so that guy will say you made one crore of extra income this year okay so this is we can generalize it it's not just for bank deposits whether investments in assets in foreign countries whether unrealized gains on investments in assets in foreign countries are to be treated as the assessee's income for that financial year or not are you following okay now can you see that the statement is not tied to the facts of this case only if i have another case tomorrow where there is a similar situation some guy has bought a house in portugal or something okay and that house is appreciated in value okay or it could have even depreciated in value then the question would arise whether he is allowed to take that as a loss are you following some guy could have bought a house in portugal okay and that house might have either appreciated or depreciated in value then the dispute can arise as to whether because the assessee will always want to take it as a loss if there is a depreciation and then the assessing officer will not want to allow it as a loss okay so the same question so whether profits and losses okay on uh, investments in assets in foreign countries okay are to be included in the assessee's income for the financial year or not this is clear yes. are you following now this is a very general statement of the issue because this can now be applied to multiple cases which can have similar facts okay because who is not convinced okay what is the problem that you have where do you have the problem you are not you are not uh, you are not in agreement with the way that i have stated the issue, the underlying issue so how should it be stated according to you so absolutely to be very honest i am not getting what you are saying no no but did you understand the basic controversy you understood the basic controversy so this guy has put some money on a deposit on deposit in singapore it is still lying in singapore dollars but since you can observe the market rate for singapore dollars to indian rupee you can convert let's say that amount was say let's say 5 million singapore dollars just for the sake of argument okay so when you converted that uh, 5 million singapore dollars at the uh, rate when he converted when he start when he actually took the money out okay that was worth only 3 crores okay now if you convert with the current market rate if you notionally convert that singapore dollar amount okay that is amounting to 3 crores and 15 lakhs okay and the assessee as assessing officer is saying that that extra 15 lakhs that is your even though it's your unrealized profit it should be treated as your income for this financial year is this clear okay unrealized profit so the controversy is about unrealized profit or unrealized loss also you can generalize it because once the court rules that unrealized profits are to be counted then unrealized losses will also have to be counted okay and the assessee should be allowed a deduction because you can't have it both ways okay so uh, the revenue can't have it both ways so is this clear now so this is what is meant by stating the issue at a general level so you try to understand you look at the particular facts of the case and from there you try to apply a process of abstraction and try to state the issue at a very very general level at which level it can be applied to multiple similar cases is this clear you understood okay so uh, this is one point we had to discuss and so now if how does this lead very easily to the ratio decidendi okay now this will also help you to understand what is the ratio decidendi now think about the ratio in this particular what will happen let's assume that in this particular case the judge rules in favor of the at the itat level the judge rules in favor of the uh, assessee okay so if the once you know that the once you stated the issue in this general form okay and then you know the decision given by the judge you know that the judge has ruled in favor of the assessee okay so obviously the judge always rules based on a reason it's not like the assessee is ruling right so uh, the moment you know that the judge has ruled in favor of the assessee immediately you know that what would have been the judge's reasoning for ruling in favor of the assessee that means the judge has established a principle remember ratio decidendi is reason for deciding okay so the judge must have believed that unrealized profits and losses should not be included in the assessee's uh, you know profit and loss statement for the year okay and that's why he did not include the 15 lakhs in his uh, profit in his income for the year is this clear and that is the only way so effectively by ruling in favor of the assessee the judge is laying down a principle that unrealized profits and losses are not to be included in the assessee's income on on invest on investments in assets in foreign countries is this clear okay so from the decision itself you can clearly see the ratio decidendi of the case and you can see how a general statement of the issue will directly lead you along with the decision in the case it will directly lead you to the ratio decidendi of the case is this clear 
okay now very quickly we don't have my mind have to overlook uh, uh, just sh overshoot your time a little bit i want to quickly cover a topic uh, which i covered in the other class <laughs> That you want to take a break and come back. <laughs> okay, now briefly one. Okay, guys, one sec. I I will just take. I will just uh, include this in your in your discussion. Okay, and you can just think about it. There is a discussion today. There is a because we haven't reached time yet. One minute, guys. We haven't reached the end, end of the class yet. One sec. So uh, there is a there is a news item today on HCL. Have you followed that HCL and IBM? IBM. You guys are supposed to be reading all the stuff. This is there on Bloomberg Quint. Okay, so there is a discussion. HCL has bought uh, for a 1.8 billion dollars. HCL has bought a bunch of software assets from IBM. Okay, so just think of somebody buying Word, PowerPoint, and Excel from Microsoft. Okay, when you buy software assets, okay, it's like any other assets. They are going to generate a bunch of revenues because when you have these software pieces of software, you are going to license them out, and you will get the licensing revenue. Okay so every year you will get licensing revenue for these products okay so now what has happened is that the news item is that uh, the stock of hcl has uh, tumbled on the uh, on the stock markets today on the back of this news okay that uh, they have spent 1.8 billion dollars to buy these assets from ibm okay so now the question is basically going back to just uh, the discussion i had in the other class is that you guys have done this npv uh, calculation for projects okay yeah. You've done an LPV calculation for projects. Okay. So if you take, if you take, let's say, uh, just a simple. So the point is that you have, and later on you're going to do bond valuation and stock valuation. Okay. So the point is that every, all these asset valuations actually are uh, essentially the same thing. Okay. Essentially, let me just see if we don't, if we don't have this here. Uh, we don't really have this here. But I'll just try to. So the point is essentially that. The, the framework that you use for NPV, what is the framework that you use for your NPV? You project the cash flows, <laughs> you project the cash flows, okay, and then you discount them, okay, you discount them and then you deduct the cost of it to get your NPV on the project, okay. So the point is if you forget about the cost part first, let's the cost part is how much it costs you to get the project and the cost should be more than the value of the cash flows uh, sorry cost should be less okay should be less than the value of the cash flows okay so it's essentially the value of the project can be seen as everything except the cost part okay so you compare the value of the project to the cost of the project and then if it's a uh, you know positive npv you take it you take the project okay so now the point i'm trying to emphasize is that that framework that you've used for the value part of the project leaving aside the cost term okay leaving aside the cost term that is the same framework you use to value every asset okay so the point of today's news item is you should be able to use your finance theory knowledge to understand business news stories okay so today the stock market is selling off i mean it is dumping the shares of hcl because they've paid 8 billion 1.8 billion dollars okay so the question i asked the other guys was that what do you think the market believes as far as the value of those assets they've bought they bought those software assets valuation of software asset is no different from software assets is no different from a project valuation you will project okay just shut it off for a while i'll just take two minutes okay, i'll just take two minutes one minute please please be quiet let's understand this principle okay you should know how these general principles can be applied to value every asset so what you did to value the npv same thing will happen in the case of bonds same thing will happen in the case of equities except the cash flows of the project will change in the case of equities to dividends or earnings in the case of bonds it will change to a bond coupon but the basic structure of the equation will remain the same you should be able to see the sameness the oneness of everything okay now even for valuation of software assets same principle what returns is it going to make project the returns and then discount the returns to find the value of the project so because the market is selling off the shares of hcl the point i wanted to make is i'm just going to i'm not going to i'm going to save time the point i wanted to make in this class and the other class is that the market therefore believes that the value of those software pro, uh, pieces of software that they have bought okay from IBM if you do the present value of those software uh, you know pieces of software by projecting their licensing revenues and discounting those licensing revenues that value that value of that set of cash flow you know returns must be less than 1.8 billion because these guys have paid 1.8 billion for something 
and therefore the market must believe that what they paid 1.8 billion for is actually worth much, much less than 1.8 billion mm. and that's why they're selling off the shares of HCL okay I just wanted to make sure that you're able to apply this framework and come to this conclusion are you following yes. okay so I'll include the article in your um, in your um, notes okay I'll just put it in your contract law notes itself okay and then you can just read the article and guys you have to step up your uh, coverage of business news nobody knew except i think the other class i don't know who it was uh, somebody remember i think uh, 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 sg2 was aware of this news everybody else was not aware okay sg2 is uh, your singer uh, yeah. okay guys you can go now